If you've grown up in church, you've probably heard the old hymn, count your blessings one by one. But even if you don't feel very blessed today, there's a treasure in God's Word just waiting for you to possess it. Stay with me as we discover the blessing that's coming up as Arkansas Live starts right now. I don't know about you, but I have heard teachings on the blessing. I've read books on the blessing. I have watched video DVDs of ministries teaching on the blessing. <clears throat> this all began several years ago, and I would listen to the teachings. I would be in the services. I'd read the books, and I, I never could feel that I was getting the total understanding of what the blessing was all about. Most of the teachings that I heard uh, referring to the blessing, we're going to read it in just a minute in Proverbs 10, 22, was all talking about uh, the material blessings or the financial blessings. While the blessing is inclusive of that, I feel like I have finally understood through the person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has really ministered to me because I've been pressing in, trying to grasp the, the truth of this, the, the whole truth, uh, the, the, the balance, the revelation of the scriptures concerning the blessing. And I've read Proverbs 10, 22, I don't know how many times, and, and meditated on it and prayed and asked the Lord, give me a full understanding of this verse. I, I don't want just a piece of it or a part of it. I want to know what you're, what you're telling us and why it's important. And so uh, after many years of studying this, I believe that I've finally gotten, I don't, I don't guess I could say all the truth because nobody has all the truth, but I've gotten a complete understanding of what this blessing is uh, that Proverbs is talking about in Proverbs 10, 22. So why don't you turn there with me uh, and we'll get started uh, today. Now, I warn you, I may sometime during this teaching, today, tomorrow, the rest of the week, I may have emotional responses because when I first started in the ministry and I began to read the Bible, Actually, I had left my job. The Lord told me it was time for me to leave my secular employment, and he called me full-time into the ministry. And I was uh, 30 years old, and I didn't know what to do and how to do it. I had a family to take care of and bills to pay. I had responsibility, and I, I really didn't know where to start. There were no Bible colleges like we have today. Uh, and the Lord told me, he said, I don't have time for you to go to school. I'm going to teach you. So instead of going to work eight hours a day, I would go into my little office that had a, a door over file cabinets. That was my desk. The bed was still in the bedroom. We converted it to an office. And my wife had more Bible knowledge than I did. And I was a new convert. And I wanted some kind of guideline I just didn't want to be out there on my, my own all by myself. I wanted to make sure I didn't get off. So I started studying a, a Bible correspondence course by E.W. Kenyon called The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption. And then I discovered many books that he had written. But my wife had a scroll, and it was a, it was a long scroll. It wasn't very wide. It was about this, this wide, but it was very long. It would cover uh, the whole wall in our bedroom, in the bedroom that was my office. And it was written by John Hall. And it was from Genesis to Revelation. And it was beautifully done. It had artwork and it took all the scriptures, all the dispensations. It took the law. It took grace. It took uh, the millennium. Everything that you would study, all the dispensations from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And I studied that every day. I would go in and I'd start reading my Bible. 
Now, my wife told me to start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which I did. But then I went to Genesis, <clears throat> and I started reading Genesis. And I'll tell you what, in the Old Testament, I fell in love with God. I, I didn't see God as a hard taskmaster, as a judge, as, a, as some people do. I saw God as a God of love, trying to bless his people. And they were so stubborn and so full of sin and so full of rebellion. They rebelled at him at just about every turn. Everything God tried to do to bless his family, to bless his children, they would slap him in the face. They would murmur. They would complain. Uh, he was trying to bless them. And, I, and so I, I literally wept as I studied the Old Testament to see time and time again how God loved his, his family that he had created and how from the very beginning he was trying to create or he did create an earth and he blessed his family. So let's take a look here at Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Now, if you have your Bible, take in notes, underline the blessing. The blessing. Say it out loud. The blessing. Now, there are many references to many different blessings in the Scripture, Old and New Testament. Um, what we normally hear taught with this verse in Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing, we hear about Abraham's blessing or the blessings of obedience that you find in Deuteronomy 28. We'll talk about all of that. But I, I wasn't satisfied that that's all there was. So I kept reading it. The blessing of the Lord. First of all, what is the blessing of the Lord? The Bible tells us. There's a blessing that God conferred upon Adam and Eve in the garden. There is a priestly blessing that God instructed Aaron to read to the children of Israel. There's a Mosaic blessing. There's a, a Noah blessing. There's a, uh, even the, uh, the rainbow in the sky. God put up there to remind Noah and all the rest of us that God cut covenant with his people, that he would never, ever flood the earth again with water. Uh, there's a Davidic blessing. Uh, there's the uh, Abrahamic blessing. There's the, uh, there, there's the blessing of the new covenant. There's, there's so many blessings that I was having a hard time figuring out what this verse was referring to. So read it again. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. The blessing, it maketh, maketh rich. So the blessing maketh rich. And now some people are offended at the word rich. <laughs> um, some people see that word rich. I'm serious. They're, they're Christians. When you say the word rich, some people are offended by it. They're, they're, they rebel against it. To them, the word rich is a four-letter word. And they're offended by it. Even in our secular society today, our politicians... Our, our, our new age government, our secular humanist government, uh, they use the word rich uh, uh, offensively, progressively, etc. And those that are poor take offense at that word rich. The poor are angry at the rich. Well, hey, if rich is a four letter word, poor is also a four letter word. But not many people take offense to the four-letter word poor. <laughs> I 
I heard one preacher say one time, he was so poor when he was raised up that he could only afford. He said, we weren't poor. We were po. He said, we were so poor. We could only afford half of the word. <laughs> we, could, we could only afford the po. We could only afford half of the word poor. So there are people on both sides of the road, I guess, in a ditch on either side. There's some people that abuse the word rich. There's some people misuse it. There's some that, that will get off into greed, covetousness, the love of money. We know from the scriptures all those things are incorrect, wrong. But this word rich here, it, it, if you look it up, it simply means to accumulate. It means wealth. It means to prosper. Actually, um, it means to accumulate, to prosper, to be wealthy. Now, we tend to, in our culture, we tend to only think of the word rich in, in the context of money. But the Bible tells us, and we'll read this over in Timothy, he, the, the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, says, to the rich, I speak to the rich, I'm addressing the rich. To those that are rich, they are to abound in good works. So being rich is not limited to money, but it is applied to doing good. And, and you'll see this in the scripture too in the Old Testament, Genesis 12, verse 2, uh, when God was talking to Abraham, establishing the Abrahamic covenant, he said, now I'm going to bless you, but I'm going to make you a blessing. So, and we'll study all of this, the purpose and the responsibility of the blessing is not self-centered. It's not get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. That is not what this word rich and the blessing are limited to. So the blessing uh, refers to growth. It refers to abundance Jesus said in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's part of the blessing, the abundance. Abundance is having more than enough. And all of these that we're going to read about and study about all had more than enough. They had abundance. They had more than enough for them and their family, and they had enough for others. So when you take the stinginess out of it, when you take the self-centeredness and the covetousness and the greed out of it, you, you have a better view of what God intended for the blessing and for abundance, wealth, prosperity, growth. So the blessing, it maketh rich. Now I know the Bible does tell us if you don't work, you don't eat. The Bible tells us to work. The Bible tells us, too, that we will be blessed by the work of our hands. Um, the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. We know we're supposed to work. But if you put everything in perspective, and my goodness, it would take a long time to go back and pull this all together. But if you don't put everything into perspective, you'll think that you are working for a living. When in reality, you're working because the blessing is going to come through the work of your hands. And it's not just for you, but it's for your family, your friends, your church, missionaries. It's for anybody that has a need. If you're not blessed, you can't be a blessing. So Paul wrote to Timothy and said, I, I encourage you to say to the rich, um, be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to share. 
the blessing it makes rich. Let's say it this way. The abundance, the blessing of God on our life will cause us to prosper, to be wealthy, and to accumulate and to grow. The blessing it maketh rich. Now, if you have an unhealthy or, or a warped sense of understanding where rich is concerned, you, you'll, get, you'll get off. Uh, go to Proverbs chapter 1, and let's look at verse. This, this is a good example. Look at Proverbs 1 and verse 32. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. So it, it doesn't say what you may have heard, prosperity or money or riches will make a fool of you. That's, it doesn't say that at all. That's a misunderstanding and a misapplication of the Word of God. The Bible says that prosperity ruins a fool. It doesn't say it'll make a fool out of you. It ruins a fool. In other words, if you're a fool, prosperity will ruin you. But God said, the blessing of the Lord, and this is where I got emotional the other day, the blessing of the Lord. And I go back to my study of the Old Testament when I first got saved, the blessing of the Lord. Oh, how many times have we refused God's blessing? thinking we were being humble, thinking that we were pleasing God. I have minister friends, or I had minister friends. I mean, they're still my friends. They're just not here on earth anymore. They're in heaven. <laughs> and, and they would tell me, they would use phrases. And, and as a young minister, you're very impressionable. And I would, I would hear them say, it's kind of Christian lingo, Christian talk. Christian, Christian slang, if you please. Uh, God won't share the gold or the glory. And, and I had ministers tell me that they took a vow of poverty, never to own anything. They didn't own anything. It all belonged to God. And, you know, as a young minister, you're thinking, boy, that's so powerful. That's, that's just wonderful. That's so anointed. That's so honorable. But it wasn't, and it wasn't biblical. <laughs> How, how would you feel? Let's just take now. I don't know whether you're a parent or not, but let's assume if you can imagine with me. You're a parent and, and God has blessed you and you want to bless your children. And so you come home from work and you bring your child a, a, a gift and they say, oh, no, I, that's an insult to me. I can't take that. I wouldn't have that. I don't want that, daddy. I don't want that, mama. Quit doing that to me. Now, you would think that would be strange. I would think it would be strange. I know every time my daddy um, went on a business trip and he would come home, most of the time he would bring my sister and I a gift. And we got to where we could hardly wait for him to come home because we knew he was going to come give us a gift. My sister, now she, my sister taught school. She's two years younger than me. She taught school most of her life, all her life. She retired as a school teacher. But my sister was the sweetest little thing. You, as a little girl, my sister, I wish I had a picture for him to put up of her. As a little girl, she looked just like Shirley Temple. I'm serious. I mean, she was the most beautiful little girl. And, and she loved and adored me, her brother, her big brother. And any time somebody would come and give her something, piece of bubble gum, piece of candy or whatever, she would always look at them and she would say, you got one for my brother? Oh, it, it, yeah, that used to just really tear me up because I was mean to her. <laughs> I would tickle her. I would shoot her with a BB gun. I would, you know, big brothers and little sisters. This was, this was before I got saved, of course. But it, as a little brother, I'd... I, I treated her badly. And she would always say, you got one for my brother. Well, she, she, she understood back then 
that a gift is good. And she wanted to share it with me. Well, God is like that parent. He wants to bless his children. And yet sometimes for religious reasons, for ignorant reasons, we refuse the blessing. Oh, no, no, no. I, and I don't want that. I don't need that. I don't deserve that. I don't want people to think anything. And, and we call ourselves humble. Uh, I, don't, I don't need anything, don't want anything. Um, so don't talk to me about prosperity or being rich. Well, that just shows how short-sighted we are and how selfish we are with that attitude because we're turned inward. We're only thinking about us. We're not thinking about anybody else. How many times have you seen on VTN some of our broadcasters whose ministry is involved in feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving water to the thirsty, any number of ministries to those that are hurting. And what are they, what are they doing? They're always asking for donations to help them reach out and help these hurting people to feed the hungry, to, to minister to the needs of third world countries and uh, ungodly nations and people that are starving and dying in many cases because the government wants them to. They want to get rid of them or they don't have the means to help them. And these ministries, in, in some cases, almost become beggars. Won't you please help us do this? They have the heart for it. And how many Christians on this earth want to help those people and yet don't have the money to do it? We don't have the resources to do it in many cases, because we look at prosperity as, as an evil thing. We look at wealth as an offensive thing. We look at the word rich like somebody said a four-letter word. Well, my brothers and sisters, when you finish this week with me meditating on this scripture verse, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. It's the blessing that makes you rich. It's the blessing that God gave that causes you to grow, that causes you to accumulate. And look at this last part here. And he adds no sorrow with it. What does that mean? Well, if you go over to Genesis and you look at, and I didn't have this marked, but it, I was reminded of it. You know what happened? When uh, Adam and Eve sinned against God and they uh, lost the revelation of the blessing, the blessing was still out there, but, but they were detached from it because of their sin. Uh, look at here. Look at the, uh, the curse that came on man because of their sin. After Adam had sinned and the Lord said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon your belly you'll go and dust you'll eat all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. It shall bruise your head and it shall bruise his heel. Unto the woman said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in thy conception. In sorrow you'll bring forth children, and your desire will be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And then he went on down to tell Adam, Adam, he said, you're going to be cursed. The ground is cursed for your sake, and in sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns, thistles, it'll bring forth. Now, he said, in the sweat of your brow, you're going to work. Work was always in God's plan. A, a life of ease, and, but it was all based on work. It just wasn't work with sweat. 
It was sweatless work. It was toil and it was labor, but without the sorrow. And so here in Proverbs 10, 22, he says, the blessing of the Lord, it makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. So this blessing has had the sorrow taken off, removed. There is no sorrow to the blessing of God. There won't be any sweat. I, I know people that have worked themselves to death. <laughs> they work for money every day. Some of them work six, seven days a week. But if you talk to them about being rich or prosperous or wealthy, they look at you like, get away from me. I don't want to hear about that. I don't like, I don't like to hear about preachers talk about money, but yet you work for it five, six, seven days a week. We live in an economic world and everybody needs money. Everybody needs something to trade for goods, to barter. But, but here in the completeness of this verse, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Now, go with me over to Genesis chapter 1 and we're going to go back to where the blessing began. And this is what, this is what I was so blessed. <laughs> and you know, we say that I, I was blessed, I was blessed, I was blessed. Somebody sneezes and we say, oh, God bless you, bless you, bless you. We use the word all the time, just don't know what it means. When you say bless you when somebody sneezes, what does that mean? Well, by the definition of the word, it means to grow, <laughs> to have abundance, to accumulate, prosper, be wealthy, empowered to prosper. It, it doesn't fit, does it? Somebody sneezes, they got a, a tickle in their nose, an allergy. Well, oh, bless you. How did we ever, how did we ever start that? I, I can tell you how we started it. I might share it with you tomorrow. It's, it's, it's what we call a Southern colloquialism. But the blessing began in the garden. And that's where we're going to pick up tomorrow. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to find out where the blessing came from. What is this blessing that God reveals to us in Proverbs 10.22? VTN's on Facebook. Find us at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. You can also follow me on Twitter, happy underscore Caldwell. This episode's available to watch online. Log on to vtntv.com and click on Watch on demand. VTN is also available to watch 24-7 via live stream. Uh, all you have to do is go on to the website vtntv.com and click on live stream and you can watch us anywhere, anytime. So I'll see you uh, tomorrow. Remember Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com.